Severe Tropical Cyclone George was one of the most powerful Australian tropical cyclones on record, attaining a minimum barometric pressure of 902 umbar. It was also the strongest tropical cyclone worldwide in 2007 and the last Australian region tropical cyclone to achieve this record to date. The cyclone formed on February 26, 2007 in the Northern Territory's top end, and intensified when it entered the Joseph Bonaparte Gulf, before crossing the northern coast of the Kimberley. It moved over the Indian Ocean, intensifying to a Category 4 cyclone, and eventually crossed the Pilbara coast just east of Port Hedland at peak intensity. After further analysis from the Bureau of Meteorology, George was reclassified to Category 5. The cyclone caused significant damage to the town of Port Hedland and numerous isolated mining camps around the town. Losses in Northern Territory amounted to at least 12 million Australian dollars. Two people died and more than a dozen others were infected in a meliodosis outbreak following the Northern Territory floods. Insured damage in Western Australia amounted to 8 million Australian dollars, and there were three fatalities. Map plotting the storm's track and intensity, According to the Saphir Simpson scale on February 24, 2007, an area of low pressure began consolidating over the Arafura Sea. By 26 February, the Australian Bureau of Meteorology Warning Centre in Darwin classified the system as a tropical low with its centre situated 230 km northwest of Nahulanbai. Over the following days, the system meandered around the top end region and showed signs of gradual organisation. Initial forecasts depicted the low as moving gradually eastward and becoming a significant cyclone over the Gulf of Carpentaria, however, after approaching Malingimbi Island on 1 of March. The system doubled back to the west in response to a subtropical ridge over central Australia. Though over land, the cyclone remained well organized. Deep convection blossomed on 2 March, as the system approached the Joseph Bonaparte Gulf. Owing to favorable upper-level outflow and decreasing wind shear, the Joint Typhoon Warning Center issued a tropical cyclone formation alert for the system that day. The agency estimated the formation of a tropical depression, assigning it the identifier 17S, by 0 o'clock UTC on 3rd of March while it was still over land. Hours later, the low emerged over the Gulf and acquired gale force winds while situated 75 km south southeast of Enpeli. In light of this, the Darwin Warning Center initiated advisories on tropical cyclone George, marking the first time since Cyclone Fay, in 2004, that the Darwin office named a storm. George quickly intensified once offshore, with a very small banding eye of approximately 8 km in diameter appearing on SSMI satellite imagery, and gained winds of 95 km per hour by 1800 hours UTC. The system subsequently made landfall in the Kimberley region of Western Australia that intensity hours later. Substantial structural degradation took place over land, with the eye feature dissipating, and the bomb estimated the system to have briefly weakened to a tropical low before emerging over the extreme eastern Indian Ocean late on 4th of March. Once offshore, George regained tropical cyclone strength as it moved steadily west away from Australia. Intensification was slow due to a lack of outflow and increased wind shear. Over the following few days, most forecast models indicated that George would gradually turn to the south as it rounded the subtropical ridge and possibly strike areas between Exmouth and Onslow by 9th of March. The models continued to indicate this scenario through 6th of March, resulting in a high confidence forecast from the Perth Warning Center. Cyclone George at landfall on 8th of February, 2007 infrared satellite image of severe tropical cyclone George near peak intensity shortly before its landfall near Port Hedland on 8th of March. However, on 7th of March George took an abrupt, nearly 90-degree left turn through a weakness in the ridge and began moving almost due south. This turn caught meteorologists almost entirely off guard, with only the United Kingdom Met Office Ensemble model depicting this scenario. Post-storm reviews of the forecasting failure pointed toward four factors that may have influenced George at the time but were not initialized by the models, the extratropical transition of Cyclone Humba well upstream over the Indian Ocean. A Fujiwara interaction with Cyclone Jacob to the northwest, the beta drift effect, and poorly represented monsoonal flow. Of these factors, the monsoonal flow was determined to have been the main cause in the poor track forecast as models did not capture the degree of influence of these winds on the cyclone. This resulted in the forecast track for George having the greatest error of any cyclone in the Western Australian region in at least five years. The average error of 477 km at 48 hours was comparable to the average accuracy of forecasts in the 1980s. Coinciding with George's turn south was a notable improvement of environmental factors. 
wind shear, previously inhibiting organization, began to decrease while a nearby upper level low enhanced the system's outflow. The favorable condition allowed for an increase in both strength and size, with both the bomb and JTWC estimating the cyclone to have attained hurricane force winds by 12 o'clock UTC on 7th of March. By early on 8th of March, George featured an area of gale force winds spanning nearly 400 kilometers across, significantly larger than average. A large cloud filled I soon developed before a sudden period of rapid intensification ensued. During this phase, the cyclones I steadily contracted to a minimum diameter of roughly 22 kilometers. Between 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock UTC on 8th of March, George passed directly over Bedout Island. As the eye wall moved over the island, a record-breaking 10-minute sustained wind speed of 194 km per hour was measured. This marked the highest 10-minute wind measurement officially recorded in Australia. Based on the extreme winds measured on Bedout and additional intensification thereafter, George was estimated to have reached its peak intensity. At 12 o'clock UTC with winds of 205 km per hour and an estimated barometric pressure of 902 mbar. Automated Dvorak classifications from the Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies at University of Wisconsin-Madison peaked at 6. 8, equivalent to a high-end Category 4 on the saphir simpson hurricane wind scale, as the storm moved ashore. At 10 p. m. on 8 of March, Cyclone George made landfall 50 km northeast of Port Hedland. When it made landfall, it was still at its peak intensity. Damaging wind gusts of 154 km per hour were recorded at Port Hedland Airport weather station just before 11 p.m. The anemometer failed shortly afterwards. At 012 a. m. on 9th of March, an air pressure reading of 962. 7 hectopascals was recorded at Port Hedland Airport. This was lowest recorded at the airport during the passage of the cyclone. George weakened slowly while over land and it was downgraded to a Category 3 late on 9th of March. The next day, the Tropical Cyclone Warning Center in Perth issued its final warning for the system. George's remnants continued drifting southeastward and then southward over the next three days, before dissipating on 13th of March, in southern Australia. Cyclone George resulted in numerous schools and ports in Port Hedland being closed down to deal with a severe cyclone. Mining, oil and gas companies had to ultimately close to also deal with the threat of the imminent cyclone. People were additionally evacuated from low-lying levels near the sea, and moved either to higher ground, or further inland to cyclone shelters. Play media effects from the precursor low to George in Northern Territory as a developing tropical low, George produced prolonged heavy, in some cases record-breaking, rain across much of Northern Territory in late February through early March. The most prolific rains took place as the system strengthened and began moving away from the region. In a five-day span, numerous areas saw more than a month's worth of precipitation. Several towns and cities saw single-day rainfall records for March shattered by the system most notably Jabiru Airport with 393. 4 mm falling on 1st of March, more than three times the previous highest. Other places that broke daily records include Adelaide River, Black Point, Channel Island, Elizabeth Valley, Howard Springs, Mango Farm, Pelly Territory Wildlife Farm, Thorax Cemetery, and Walker Creek. The tremendous rains also resulted in many areas seeing their wettest march on record. Widespread flooding resulted from the rains in the region, with some areas becoming isolated by 2nd of March. Extensive damage was incurred by region's roadways, with losses reaching 12 million Australian dollars. Officials referred to the effects of the flooding as the worst in 40 years. Portions of the Kakadu and Arnhem highways were shut down, with the latter expected to remain so for a week. Throughout the top end region, a collective 101 bridges and roads were closed due to flooding. Workers at the Ranger Uranium Mine in Jabiru were forced to camp out at the mine as floodwaters overtook the area. The mine's pit was inundated and forced to shut down for nine days while processing had to be suspended for two weeks. The resulting loss in production cost energy resources of Australia 300 tons of uranium. According to resource analysts, the negative impacts of the flood in addition to lingering effects from Cyclone Monica in 2006 would result in a 2% decrease in the global supply of uranium by 2008. Economic losses sustained by the energy resources of Australia were estimated to reach 200 million Australian dollars. At least one house nearby was submerged. Just south of Jabiru, 35 people were airlifted from the Gagju Lodge in Kuinda. Helicopters were used to drop food to personnel stranded at outstations in the Kakadu National Park. 
Severe storms in the park spawned a rare tornado near the Mary River Ranger Station. The 300 meters wide twister leveled trees and destroyed caravans along a 3 kilometers path. In some cases, trees were even debarked. Based on the damage, the tornado was estimated to have had winds between 230 and 270 km per hour. Severe thunderstorms battered Darwin on 3rd of March with frequent lightning, torrential rain, and destructive wind gusts up to 120 km per hour. Downed trees and power lines left 10,000 residents without electricity and flooded roadways isolated some in suburban areas. Flight delays were common at Darwin International Airport, while two had to be cancelled. Four people in Adelaide River required rescue from their home. Debris from flooding in the town left Main Street and a nearby bridge impassable. The most severe flooding took place in Npeli which saw roughly 930 mm of rain in less than a week. Evacuation of 90 people from 47 homes in the town took place on 3rd of March as rising waters from the local billabong became contaminated with sewage. Residents initially attempted to protect their homes with sandbags but waters rose too fast and overtopped the barrier. Waters reached halfway up homes in the lowest lying areas, with high tide expected to reach 7. 2 meters on 4th of March. Waters began subsiding in the town by 6th of March, though low-lying areas remained partially submerged. More than 60 homes sustained flood-related damage. The local school and its library sustained extensive damage, with the latter being damaged beyond repair. An estimated 350 of the 1,400 cattle kept in paddocks near the community were swept away during the flood, at least 70 were known to have drowned by 7th of March. Cyclone George was the most powerful cyclone to hit Port Hetland since Cyclone Joan in 1975. The cyclone's peak intensity of 902 hectopascals, with wind gusts of up to 285 km per hour was estimated following Dvorak analysis of satellite imagery. Power and telephone lines were down in Port Hetland, many roofs and fences were torn down and trees were uprooted. At least one house was destroyed. The Pilbara region was declared a disaster zone, and the Australian Defence Force was on standby to provide extra help. At around 10 p. m. on 8 of March, the Bureau of Meteorology's Port Hedland weather radar was damaged by the cyclone and was offline for nearly a day. Tropical Cyclone Jacob struck almost the same area as George only three days later, although it was not as damaging or deadly as George. It did however cause some minor flooding. Three people were killed and 28 others were injured as a result of the severe cyclone. One death and the majority of the people injured occurred at a Fortescue Metals Group camp, about 100 kilometers south of Port Hedland. Strong winds and flooding delayed the rescue efforts for most of the day. However, all injured workers were airlifted to the hospital in Port Hedland after the cyclone passed. The deaths occurred when strong winds knocked over temporary accommodation shelters known as dongas. The second death occurred at Indy Station, located between Port Hedland and the mining camp. The man died from severe internal injuries while escaping from his wrecked donga, trying to seek help at the main station homestead. A third death occurred when a man who was transferred to a Perth hospital on 11th of March died due to the injuries received when the cyclone hit at the Fortescue camp. Starting on 7th of March, the Gun Bologna Health Clinic in Npeli began warning residents of a possible melioidosis outbreak resulting from the floods. They urged residents to wear shoes and wash their hands before eating to avoid infection. More than a dozen people contracted the disease over the following weeks, with two dying as a result. Three others were hospitalized in the Royal Darwin Hospital. Reconstruction of roads in and around Darwin began by 9th of March, however, portions of the Arnhem Highway remained underwater. The Department of Planning and Infrastructure stated that a 15 meters bridge would have to be constructed over the West Alligator River where a culvert collapsed. The one Australian dollar. Two million bridge was completed on 5th of April and allowed Arnhem Highway to completely reopen. Repair work on roads continued for more than a month, with additional rains in the following weeks creating additional potholes. A week after the floods, there was some concern over a delay in aid from the government. However, authorities assured that supplies would be provided in a timely manner once need assessments were complete. The Salvation Army began collecting supplies for the 90 people rendered homeless by 13th of March with additional requests for assistance made to the Australian Red Cross. Shipments of supplies to Npeli began on 20th of March, with a total of 14 flights scheduled over two days. The airlifts brought more than 200,000 Australian dollars worth of goods, consisting of mattresses, blankets, sheets, refrigerators, washing machines, and stoves, to the community. 
Cyclone George weakening inland over Western Australia on 9th of March on 9th of March, Prime Minister John Howard announced that persons injured by the storm or those whom lost their home would be eligible for funding through the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payment Program. The initiative ultimately provided 530 people with a collective 630,000 Australian dollars in aid. After Cyclone George struck the Pilbara coast, a relief fund was set up to help the victims of the storm. Mining companies, business, and residents all donated money to assist with the cause, and within 48 hours the town of Port Hedland was able to raise just over 520,000 Australian dollars. BHP Billiton also helped recover Port Hedland by giving the local government 1 million Australian dollars each year which will fund for a large part of an enhancement scheme with the Western Australian state government to improve the town's appearance. Schools in South Hedland remained closed due to safety concerns about the damage caused by Cyclones George and Jacob until 19 March, after the local community joined in a massive cleanup. In commemoration of the deaths that took place, the Fortescue Metal Groups commissioned the McNally Newton Landscape Architects to construct a memorial in South Hedland. Acclaimed sculptor Ron Gombach designed a 12 meters twisted, steel monument for the project. The memorial was opened in March 2009, two years after the storm. Lawsuits The Australian Workers' Union launched a scathing attack on the Fortescue Metals Group Limited, saying they were disgraced that no evacuation took place before the cyclone hit. The AWU were also concerned about the buildings at the campsite as they were only built to withstand a Category 2 cyclone. Almost all of the buildings located at the campsite were destroyed. Fortescue and its subsidiary the Pilbara Infrastructure were charged with a combined 18 counts of failing to provide or maintain a safe workplace over Cyclone George and appeared in Perth Magistrates Court. The magistrate dismissed all charges and when that decision was appealed to the Supreme Court of Western Australia the appeal was also dismissed, with justice. Stephen Hall finding that Fortescue had met their duty to provide a safe workplace by engaging qualified and experienced experts to manage the Dongas. Both courts had heard that the company contracted to build the Dongas, and T-Link, had given assurances to Fortescue that the Dongas had been constructed to industry standards when it had not. NT link was granted immunity from prosecution in exchange for its testimony against Fortescue. Thanks for watching.